Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We are also very pleased to be collaborating with the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard's Kennedy School in co-presenting tonight's discussion. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We are so grateful to have this timely opportunity to explore U.S. foreign policy and China with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Lucy Hornby is a fellow at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism. She has lived in China for 20 years, most recently serving as Deputy Bureau Chief in Beijing for the Financial Times. Hornby has reported from every Chinese province and region for the Financial Times and Reuters on topics ranging from elite politics to the trade war and environmental pollution. She first moved to China with Princeton in Asia, a program that builds bridges between the U.S. and Asia, and taught English in Wuhan. Hornby has led investigations into some of China's biggest and most indebted companies, including Financial Times examination of the ownership of HNA, one of the country's largest conglomerates. Her coverage won the 2018 Society of Publishers in Asia Award for Excellence in Business Reporting. Welcome also to Yasheng Huang, the Epic Foundation Professor of International Management and Faculty Director of Action Learning at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His current research includes a book project titled The Nature of the Chinese State, collaboration with researchers at Tsinghua University on Chinese historical technological inventions, work on a systematic risk management approach to food safety in China, and research on venture finance, the production of scientific knowledge, and work of the future in China. He has published numerous articles in academic journals and in media, and 11 books in English and Chinese. At MIT, Huang founded and directs China Lab and India Lab, which have provided low-cost consulting services to over 360 small and medium enterprises in China and India. Also so pleased to introduce Anthony Sage, our moderator for this evening's discussion. He is the director of the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation and Daiwu Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, teaching courses on comparative political institutions, democratic governance, and transitional economies with a focus on China. In his capacity as Ash Center Director, Sage also serves as the director of the Rajawali Foundation Institute for Asia and the faculty chair of the China programs, the Asia Energy Leaders Program, and the Leadership Transformation in Indonesia Program. Currently, he is also a guest professor at the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University, China. He advises a wide range of government, private, and nonprofit organizations on work in China and elsewhere in Asia, and is the author and editor of many books and articles. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, for the generous introduction. And uh, also, thank you to all of you uh, who are joining us uh, to look at this uh, event. First, I want to thank uh, the Kennedy Library staff for organizing this forum on the very timely and extremely important topic of the U.S.-China relationship. As Alan uh, just mentioned, we really have two very distinguished guests uh, with us, uh, both of whom uh, have an extensive experience of working in China. And you heard the work that Lucy had done and the work that Yashon had done. So let us get down uh, to it. I think that even before President Trump uh, made his comments on Friday that escalated tensions, in my view, the relationship was already in a downward spiral. 
exacerbated by the pandemic and the recent Chinese legislation, of course, on, nat on the national security law for Hong Kong. I think uh, the, the relations are about as bad as any time that I can remember since the late 1970s. And that also includes the international response to the uh, crushing of the student-led demonstrations in 1989. So China's economic uh, rise and its inclusive, increasing global role is certainly changing geopolitics very differing responses within the United States about how America should deal with this. However, I would say that there's a general consensus that the nature of the relationship has changed and that the previous way of interacting with China is not really viable uh, moving forward. But I think we see a bifurcated response to it. There are those who see China's rise as a threat as it becomes the world's largest economy and therefore, they've pushed towards seeking to constrain its rise. I think President Trump's tariff war is the most extreme response within this framework. And also, there have been suggestions that perhaps uh, America should promote the Indo-Pacific project to tie up alliances to be able to uh, constrain China's rise. On the other hand, though, there are those who, while favoring modified engagement, avoid by what they see perhaps as the progress of engagement today, but also by the challenges which China uh, still will be experiencing internally, and whether that really means that China can project its power far into the future and beyond. And I think we see splits in those responding. Many of those favoring a tougher response tend to come from military and security services, but many of those favoring the second response have been in the academic sector and some from the business sector who have benefited uh, from those relations. But I think we also see a generational uh, split. But some are suggesting that we might be on the brink of a new Cold War. And one person has even suggested, well, perhaps we're actually in that uh, Cold War. So I'd like to start by asking our two guests how they do see the relationship. And are we running into the brink of a Cold War? And perhaps, Lucy, uh, we'll start with you. Well, thanks very much, Tony. And it's a real pleasure to be with you and um, with Professor Huang um, for this talk. Um, I returned to the US in August, um, last August, after about 25 years in Asia. And so a few things really struck me right off the bat. Um, one was, as you mentioned, that there's been a real bifurcation of attitudes towards China. Um, and I kind of mentally divide it between the admiration camp and the suspicious of everything camp. Um, I think both camps get something right and something very, very wrong. Um, what the admiration camp gets right is how much China has um, developed and really caught up to the U.S. in the last 20, 25 years. Um, but what they get wrong is that while well, one third of Chinese really enjoy the same kind of lifestyle that we in the West are accustomed to, uh, another two thirds do not. And in fact, that story of China of rising living standards has actually stalled and gone into reverse um, in the last uh, five or six years for those uh, kind of two thirds of Chinese uh, people. Um, on the suspicious of everything camp, um, I can't say that I disagree with their analysis on a lot of things um, and certainly I think the trade war could be useful in having U.S. corporations not put all their eggs in the China basket. Um, but what I think that they get wrong is that it's not enough to accuse China of things. We also have to provide a positive example ourselves. And I think people have lost sight of the degree to which the U.S. is no longer doing so. Um, and that kind of brings me to my second point. Um, I think COVID exacerbated uh, those two camps. And uh, my second point is that COVID itself, I think, changed the way the U.S. is perceived overseas, and especially within China. So when I got to China in the mid-90s, the U.S. was really looked at as a model for how to do many, many things, um, how to um, run your medical system, for instance, uh, civil society, lifestyles, um, how to govern well, and financial sectors. The list goes on and on. And I think you could see that even in January, you know, when the outbreak first came out, lots of sci Chinese scientists and doctors reached out to their American counterparts uh, because they thought the U.S. could help them find a solution 
and because they thought it was important that the U.S. and the international society knew about what was happening in Wuhan. Um, but with the six-week head start, we failed to uh, avoid any of the chaos and miscoordination that we had seen in China in January. I mean, we, with all this warning, we did not manage to do any better at all. Um, and so I think we need to really ask if in the future we will see that uh, attempt to Um, they may see problems with their own government, but a lot of them currently feel that China is better governed than the U.S., um, especially the middle and upper middle classes. And I, I think that the COVID um, outbreak reinforced that for many in China, for many in Asia. And again, I think that just means that we in the U.S., you know, if we want to say that we want to maintain our position of leadership, we need to kind of pull up our socks and deserve it a bit more. Um, so that's my biggest takeaway, having been back here for about 10 months now. Thanks, Mr. Thanks, Mr. I mean, I think the um, disillusionment with uh, the US in the West more broadly started with the 08 09 financial crisis, where it seemed as if a model uh, to which one should aspire really brought chaos uh, globally. And I think we've seen since then a kind of emerging stronger pride in what China itself has achieved. And I think if you throw into that, some of the things that you were mentioning more recently, Lucy, that I think is very true. Yasheng, how do you see uh, first uh, generally the relationship and are we headed into a new Cold War? Uh, I think, uh, th thank you first of all, uh, Tony, for um, uh, for being the, uh, the discussion leader of this, uh, of this panel and, and happy to share the panel with Lucy as well. And thank you, Alan, for the introduction. Uh, let me compare the current relationship between China and the U.S. to the real Cold War, the Cold War between U.S. and Soviet Union. And there are some substantial differences. Those differences may or may not give us optimism about the relationship between China and the United States, but I think, I think it's important to point out some of the differences. Why is that China and U.S. have much more to lose from moving toward a Cold War than Soviet Union and the United States? Obviously, the Cold War was always in the shadow of a nuclear, uh, nuclear war, but the two sides worked out a protocol to deal with each other, so they had a pretty good understanding of the other side. Whereas we don't really see that now between China and the United States. Uh, almost all the engagement mechanisms developed over the years between China and, and the United States have broken down under the current administration. Uh, let me just also put it uh, clearly that it's not just under Trump, but also under President Xi Jinping of China. The two countries move toward a more hostile uh, 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 a stance toward each other. So that's one big difference. The other big difference is that we're moving toward a Cold War at a time when the two sides have so much to gain from the relationship. That's not true between Soviet Union and the United States. Billions of dollars of trade and investments are at stake. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese students are studying in the United States. You know, people like me who came to the U.S. and studied mm -hmm. in the U.S. and decided to, uh, to stay in the U.S., you couldn't find the counterpart of that in the Cold War, right? Chinese scientists are working collaboratively with the U.S. scientists. Chinese investors are making investments in high-tech uh, uh, companies, uh, some of them around Boston, you, you don't have that uh, between uh, U.S. and Soviet Union. The third difference, I would say, that the United States was more a coherent society, coherent political system during the time of the Cold War than it is now. There was decent bipartisanship in the United States and not just about domestic issues, but about international affairs, about the approach toward the Soviet Union. There's no 
bipartisanship, bipartisanship today in the United States. The political system in the, in the United States is utterly dysfunctional. Look at what's happening now in this country in terms of the race riots and, and, and things like that. Right? So you have, a, you have a country that is incapable of dealing with a rising power and incapable of dealing with public health threat and the kind of uh, racial uh, uh, issues uh, are going on today. Uh, that, so, so I would say that the probability of making mistakes is much more uh, substantial than it was during the uh, Cold War. So for those reasons, I actually think that if China and the United States settle on the Cold War between Soviet Union and the United States, that's actually good news because at least there's a protocol of engagement. At least both sides understand precisely what they have to lose and what they have to gain. I think the thing that I worry most is that the two sides really don't understand each other anymore. And the probability of making a mistake, making a miscalculation is very, very high. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Yoshan. Let me follow up on, on a point that you seem to be indicating, because one of the other um, phrases which is banded around is the decoupling of the economies. The, the picture you're sketching uh, maybe might suggest, well, we might be able to decouple somewhat in terms of trade, but if you think about financial markets and other areas, and already decoupling did uh, start at China's behest by blocking Facebook, Google, and so on, but how realistic is a, is a decoupling? You seem to indicate it's not. I, I actually think it's quite realistic um, because decoupling in trade, in finance, in capital market does not just require policy to decouple. It also requires how the business community, how universities, how companies perceive the future if they perceive the future to be one of hostility, they may take actions today to decouple, right? So you may, they, they may not be a White House executive order to decouple, but if the perception is that the relationship is going to go from bad to worse, the companies are going to make adjustments. It's actually already happening. Companies are moving operations away from China uh, to Southeast Asia, and to other countries, or back home to the United States, back home to Japan. And in terms of the financial sector, uh, I doubt very much that the Chinese companies are going to find the U.S. capital market to be the uh, to be their choice for their listing, right? And uh, investment banks uh, working on Chinese deals. I don't think they are going to find as many deals as they did before. So. You already see market reactions moving in a way toward decoupling, even without a explicit policy to decouple the two economies. Okay. Lucy, you've written really insightfully on the Chinese economy for, for a long period of time now. And just following on from what Yashan was talking about, one of President Trump's acclaimed achievements has been with the tariff wars and that uh, that brought China to the phase one trade deal in January. And he talks about this helping bring manufacturing back to the US. Now, if I remember correctly, I think the peak of manufacturing jobs in the US was uh, 1952. And as an employer, it's been declining ever since. But how would you interpret that phase one trade deal from your perspective? So I think there's a couple of um, issues here. It's being um, promoted to the U.S. Uh, public as bringing jobs back to the U.S. Um, I think that that is totally unrealistic because, you know, the U.S. is a pretty high wage market um, and jobs lost out of China. Many of those will go to um, Southeast Asia, for instance, um, India and many countries in Africa, still early stages, but they're hoping to attract some of those jobs themselves. Uh, what I think you do have, though, is the US 
Um, and here I have to say that I kind of agree with the Trump administration. The U.S. was running into a situation where we had really concentrated our supply chains in China to an extraordinary degree. Um, and that uh, the people within the Republican Party were starting to see that as a uh, security vulnerability. Um, you had other countries, uh, Japan and Korea mo most notably, who found themselves adapting what they called the China plus one policy um, after there were riots or other political pressure uh, by China against their companies. Um, but the U.S. companies had not been doing that on their own accord or, or not much. Um, and so I think that one of the goals of these tariffs was really to force American companies to diversify their supply chains um, away from China. And then this spring, no, this fall, we had a delegation of Chinese diplomats um, and a couple of us journalists here in Harvard uh, met with them. And they asked about this too. And I said, well, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world for you guys either, um, because one of the uh, consequences of this extreme concentration uh, in China was that you also had an extreme concentration of polluting industries in China. So for instance, China makes something like 50 to 60% of the world's steel, but it has 20 to 25%, it's about 20% 20, 20 of the world's population. So the pollution load that China carries um, because of this extreme concentration is not particularly good for China either. Um, but of course, China feels that uh, one of their big concerns is that if, uh, if jobs move over shore at too fast a clip, that they'll have trouble uh, supplying the employment needs within China. Um, so they've, they've done a lot, and especially since the trade war began, they've done a lot to try to keep those supply chains very sticky um, within China. And even during this time of tension, they have not retaliated against U.S. companies to the degree that we thought that they would. Um, a final note very quickly is that on the tech side, um, a lot of people in the tech industry in Asia are prepping for what they see as parallel spheres. Um, so, you know, a China standard, whatever it is, internet, you know, tech, 5G, whatever, and a U.S. standard. Um, and then both uh, standards would be trying to find markets in the rest of the world. Um, and some people even see a business opportunity there for devices or software that would be able to translate between the two standards. Um, we're a long way away from that now, but it's easy to imagine that that could happen. Yes, I think that question of, uh, you know, countries having to choose systems is going to become increasingly uh, important as time uh, moves along. You know, I think the, um, that uh, I want to turn in a moment to sort of looking forward in what's going to happen with global public goods and also the question around, you know, how might we be dealing with the relationship. But I just want to take a little sidestep, Lucy, that uh, you've, of course, been engaged with journalism for a long period of time now. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the role of journalists in reporting the relationship? And how is that work uh, being impacted upon? We've seen reports of foreign journalists not having visas uh, renewed, the US placing more restrictions around Chinese media institutions operating uh, in the US. Um, how do you experience that and what do you see? Yeah, well, I think this is really um, a a shot in the foot for ourselves, unfortunately, um, to fill everybody in. Uh, the, the foreign journalists community in China um, kind of peaked around 700 foreign journalists of all stripes, you know, Russian, American, Japanese, you name it, uh, just around the 2008 Olympics. And it was down to about 400 or so um, last year. But since last year, uh, since last fall, um, we've seen at least 25, I believe, is the latest count, journalists working for American publications have been kicked out of China. Um, and with each time, various excuses. But one of the biggest triggers was that the White House decided to reduce the number of journalist visas for Chinese journalists operating here. Why they chose to fight that battle, I really don't know. Um, the Chinese journalists operating here didn't provide much in the sense of information to the Chinese leadership. Uh, that you couldn't get from reading our media, um, but the retaliation, and China was really looking for that as an excuse, of kicking out American journalists means that increasingly we're going to be flying blind in terms of what's happening within China. Um, there are some excellent Chinese journalists and Chinese publications, of course, um, but they're under great constraints. 
Uh, and of course, unless you read Chinese, they're not as available. They, they do publish some things in English, but it's more limited. Um, so we have deliberately uh, blinded ourselves in a country that's quite opaque to us. Um, and as a strategy, I think it's um, not a very effective one. Um, in addition to that, because of COVID, there are at least 40 foreign journalists, again, of all nationalities, who were caught outside of China when the COVID quarantines hit. Uh, many of them have been unable to return to China, and many of them likely is they'll lose their visas and not get those renewed. So, you know, the Chinese government had tolerated us for a long time. Um, it's pretty clear they're trying to downsize the foreign journalist presence in China. And I think that's a real loss um, for the rest of the world at a time when we need insight into what's happening there. The Chinese may not see it this way, but I also think it's a real loss for China. Um, and why? It's because we, most foreign journalists who are there, we speak Chinese. We genuinely like the Chinese people that we interact with, and we tend to produce something that humanizes uh, the Chinese society and Chinese population to an enormous degree. Um, and, you know, during COVID, when it first hit in Wuhan, you had foreign journalists going there at risk of infecting themselves and producing very sympathetic portrayals that helped China get the support of much of the rest of the world. And the rest of the world shipped a lot of medical supplies to China during that time. You know, if they think that having shrill pronouncements from their foreign ministry is going to take over in terms of generating sympathy for the Chinese people worldwide, good luck. Yeah, wolf warrior, wolf warrior diplomacy has certainly been coming to the fore. The, um, on the, the Chinese journalists in the U.S., it may be true in the open publications that we see, they're not really feeding much very useful back to China, but we also do know that they engage in a series of internal reporting, which may give more nuance uh, to various agencies to understand what is happening in the U.S., but um, I, let me come back to uh, Yasheng. I've already got some questions beginning to come in, which we will get to, to questions in a moment. But I want to start looking forward now. First of all, looking at what some of the global implications might be in the sense of, you know, who's going to provide leadership uh, providing, you know, global public goods? I mean, neither China nor America looks very competent in terms of dealing with COVID-19. Ian Bremer has already started talking about a G0. And uh, Kevin Rudd, certainly in various pieces, has pointed out that neither China nor the US is capable at the current time of any global leadership. This seems to me going to be a terrible situation. And uh, where do you think uh, some inspiration, some ideas might come from, Yashan? Uh, so, Tony, if we can also go to one of your colleagues works on this issue, the hard power vis-a-vis -vis the soft power. I think there's a big difference between this Cold War between China and the United States and the Cold War between U.S. and Soviet Union. In the Cold War between, China, uh, between U.S. and Soviet Union, there were two clearly defined ideologies, capitalism and communism, right? Capitalism was the source of the soft power to roughly half of the population. Communism was the source of soft power to the other half. But there's no mistake which idea that you hold if you belong to one camp or the other. The current situation is much more complicated. I think the current situation is that both countries have the hard power, but they no longer command the kind of soft power that the US commanded and Soviet Union commanded. Chinese ideology is, there's not a coherent Chinese ide ideology. I mean, they call it Chinese uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, but that's really just the adjective. It doesn't really say anything about what that ideology is, and it's not coherent, it's full of contradictions. The Western liberal democracy ideology, I, I think it's still a very compelling ideology, but execution of it has been terrible, right? Starting with the 2008 financial crisis, now with the way that the U.S. is dealing with the coronavirus, and now with the racial violence and racial riots going on in our neighborhood uh, as, as we speak. So the Western 
democracy, the ideolo ideology of democracy and free market is not at its most shining moment today. So we're really entering into an era where the only thing we have is the hard power, GDP, military power, financial markets, trade, Google, technology, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, without the kind of ideology that, that, is, that, is, uh, that used to move the humankind forward. So I, re I really worry that when you have hurt power going after each other, you're going to end up in a very unpleasant situation. And you cannot really use the soft power to persuade the other side to come to your point of view. I don't think Americans are going to buy the Chinese ideology. At the current time, the Chinese are not going to see a lot of upside with the American ideology. So the only thing left is the hard power. Um, and that's not a very good situation. Yeah, that's interesting, Yashin. The one thing I always find, though, is that when a lot of Chinese authorities or others talk about democracy, they really are talking about the U.S. Correct, yes. Yet, yeah, you know, European countries have democracy, uh, Japan has democracy, Taiwan has democracy, and so there are a lot of other models out there, some of which are much more acceptance of a heavy role for the state, uh, as you know well, um, you know, back in the early part of this century, the Chinese authorities became very interested in uh, North European social democracy as alternatives. Uh, Tony Blair's Third Way, for example, became quite popular. So I agree with you in terms of the relationship here. Uh, it, it's tough to think about that in terms of soft power. But there are a lot of other alternatives out there uh, for you know, Chinese intellectuals and others thinkers to, to look at, to think about what alternative paths to the future might be. Yeah, I agree with you, Tony, but that's a topic for, 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 for academics like you and me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for people on the street, they see, uh, I mean, for people on the Chinese street, they see U.S. really as... Uh, the, the beacon or the or the or the symbol of uh, democracy, but I think it's understandable why people view U.S. that way. U.S. is very explicit about its ideology, right? U.S. is about exporting human rights values and, and, and democracy. The Europeans are a little bit more pragmatic. They don't talk about their values in the way that the Americans do. So, so in, in many ways, that you position yourself as the beacon of democracy, and then you do it in such a good job that people believe in it. So the price of that is anything when you do something wrong, you also pay the price yeah. for associating that wrong thing with democracy, right? Such as the financial crisis, such as the election of uh, Donald Trump, right? People legitimately ask the question, if a democracy is capable of delivering Trump administration, which has delivered this incredibly incompetent response to, uh, to COVID-19, then there's really something wrong with democracy. That may not be your view, that may not be my view, but I understand why common people can have that view. Okay. Lucy, coming back to the question of global public goods, how do you think we're going to be dealing with that? Certainly, you know, as we move on with the post-COVID world, uh, the President Trump has announced he wants to withdraw from the World Health Organization. Uh, China stepped in by uh, contributing funds, although a lot less funds than the European Union uh, is willing to contribute. So how are we going to deal with this important question, climate change, pandemics, uh, law of the seas? Uh, is there anyone out there who's going to be able to take a lead on any of these issues? Yeah, I, I think that China gets a lot of uh, sort of propaganda value out of um, the U.S. backing out of some of these organizations, but they don't necessarily um, have the capacity uh, to step up and fill that void, and nor do they intend to spend that money. Um, but more broadly, I'd like to build on what um, 
uh, Hoi Yashan just said, and I'd like to commit some plagiarism right here and steal from his book, uh, Capitalism with Chinese Characteristics, um, which he wrote in the early 90s and which I learned quite a lot from, so I recommend it to all our listeners. But the context in which I would recommend it now is that I think globally a lot of people look at China's um, development over the past 20, 25 years. Uh, they really admire it, especially people from poorer countries. And they say, well, I'd like some of that. And they think that therefore there's a China model that could be, uh, could be applied to them. Um, so it's not a question of democracy or style of governance. It's a question of, is there a China model and can we borrow it? Um, but because they probably haven't read Professor Huang's book, what they might fail to realize is that the China model was achieved with an unprecedented degree of foreign investment into China, unprecedented. Um, that was accompanied by a deindustrialization uh, in Southeast Asia and in the U.S., um, Rust Belt, uh, and in Western and Eastern Europe. So when you say you want that China model, China isn't actually exporting that massive investment. What they're exporting is what they think led to their success, which is their state-backed system. But at the FT, we've paid a lot of attention to what's called the Belt and Road, which is China's sort of policy for uh, extending investment into other countries. The problem is often it shows up um, in a very state heavy way uh, with all the problems that Professor Huang uh, described on China's state heavy system, but without the massive market investment uh, that accompanied China's rise. And so that's why I think that you have a lot of hope globally that the Chinese model can be applied abroad. It gives China a lot of soft power uh, but a lot of those projects, we're seeing them end in tears. And there's no reason to assume that more won't uh, continue to end in tears going forward. So when you talk about global goods, um, I think that there's going to be a lot of disappointment in China's ability to supply that. Uh, and But at the same time, the U.S. appears to be trying to retract um, to a certain degree. And so it's not very clear who would step in at that point. Yeah, certainly I get a lot of students coming to my class about China, wanting to know what the model is, what the magic is, and can they take it home? And you sadly, should assign Professor Huang's book, <laughs> Capitalism with Chinese Characteristics. And sadly, they do come away disillusioned for the most part, because, uh, you know, if there is a China model, most of it is not transportable. Uh, what they often want is some of that economic magic without some of the other things that uh, go along with it. And... You know, most countries don't have a you know 1.4 billion population and a demographic uh, which helps uh, in that process as well. But actually, you just touched on, and I, I was looking at one of the questions that came in uh, from people viewing was actually related to the BRI. I was going to come to it later, but as you touched on BRI, we might as well go to it now. And they're asking whether the, how the slowing of the Belt and Road Initiative will impact onto China's economy. So that's, a, if I may, um, that's yeah, something we, we looked at quite a lot with the Financial Times. Um, you know, before the Belt and Road really kicked off, um, there was a real slowdown of, of sort of new orders within China. Um, you know, every province in China has a road built, two road building companies, and every province in China has two bridge building companies. Every province in China has steel, et cetera, et cetera. And China's development had sucked up, uh, you know, been able to absorb a lot of that capacity. But um, as China kind of crested in uh, its infrastructure, it needed an outlet. And uh, the Belt and Road became a sort of formalized way of expressing uh, China's attempts to export and create a new order book abroad. Um, so the, the concern uh, within China with many Chinese executives is twofold. Uh, one is that that order book uh, is drying up um, because you can also max out globally uh, the way they maxed out in China. Um, and then the second concern is that if those countries that have taken on a debt to build these projects, and make no mistake, those projects will be paid for ultimately by the host country. If those countries are unable to pay um, for these projects, if the projects were built too large or if they were built in a place where there wasn't any natural demand, um, then uh, those companies back in China 
uh, will find themselves uh, holding the bag as well in terms of, of, of debt and unable to support their own workforce. So you find um, a lot of concern within China, especially within the finance ministry, uh, within journalism and environmental circles, but also within some of the state-owned companies themselves, um, that this sort of explosion of going out um, may not be sustainable. And if it is not sustainable, when the music stops, a lot of people are going to be left without chairs. Mm. Yeah, it's a huge political issue as well, because uh, to my amazement, it was actually written into the party constitution, which uh, you know, makes it really a priority, which puts the political pressure on to I completely agree with Lucy on this point. And the Belt and Road is built on a false premise, which is that you build infrastructure, you build roads, you build airports, and magically that will lead to uh, economic growth. They look at China, and that's how they take away the lesson of Chinese economic takeoff. As three of us know, that's actually not how Chinese economy took off. They invested in education, and some of, some of it as early as 1960s and 1970s, they invested in public health, and then they began to get, as Lucy pointed out, get FDI. And then uh, they liberalized the economy. They implemented market economy, entrepreneurship, private sector. It is those things that explain the Chinese economic takeoff. And once the economy took off, they had the money to invest in infrastructure. So to me, infrastructure is actually the result of economic growth rather than the reason for the economic growth. A lot of these developing countries have the issue exactly the backward. They think they build these things and then the growth will happen. If the growth doesn't happen, Lucy is absolutely right. It's going to be the Chinese banks. It's going to be the Chinese companies who are left holding the bag. And ultimately, it is the Chinese households who have put massive amounts of the savings into the Chinese banking system who are going to hold the bag. It, it, and now with the COVID-19, the, the prospect of that happening is more likely than before. Yeah, I think one of the things that, you know, we're often uh, confused by is the sort of dazzling infrastructure that is part of China. And I think for those who maybe only visit Shanghai, only visit Guangzhou, only visit Beijing, I would come back terrified that this is an incredibly powerful country. Mm -hmm. Once you move beyond those gleaming false teeth, there's a very different story about what is happening in the country. And, you know, how many international airports does uh, you know, a few small towns in China really need? But of course, a lot of that is to keep the GDP growth rates up, which reflects well on the local official, et cetera, et cetera. One thing, Yashang, you touched on there was this question of education. And uh, we have another question which came in, which was how do we think that um, the situation in the relationship at the moment is going to, one, affect educational exchanges, and two, what is it going to do for knowledge growth in the world? I know these are things that you've thought about. Yeah, so we're actually doing projects um, uh, at uh, MIT on this. Um, let, me, let me just say that if we cut off scientific collaborations with China, the first country to lose is the United States. If you look at Harvard, MIT, Stanford, these research universities, they are excellent research universities in part because they have human capital from China. Postdocs, graduate students, scientists working in laboratories. Collaborations between Chinese scientists and American scientists are producing world-class knowledge frontier knowledge about science and technology. If you decouple from Chinese research community, from Chinese scientific human capital, it is the United States. Obviously, China is also going to lose, but it is the United States that is going to lose massively as well. US companies, high-tech companies, derive massive amount of revenue from their Chinese market Qualcomm and other companies sell chips to Huawei, and they have hundreds of billions of dollars 
from China. And then they use the revenue to finance their R&D. Qualcomm is one of the few, country, uh, few companies outside of China that is capable of 5G technology. And they are financing their 5G, 5G technology by selling chips, chips to Huawei. If you cut off that relationship, it's going to undermine Qualcomm's capability in 5G, which is also going to undermine the US capability in 5G. So this is not a very good policy. This is not a very good direction. But Yaxiang, isn't there a national security risk as uh, certain parts of the administration have been suggesting? Well, so far, I actually agree with the approach, the British approach, which is that if there is security issue, then deal with that security issue, right? You can come up with a covenant. You can come up, come up with uh, 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 protective measures to minimize the security problems rather than writing off Huawei altogether. The founder of Huawei already said he's, he's willing to license all his technology to Western company and, and get Huawei out of the actual management of the technology. I actually think the Western countries should take up on his offer. He has a lot to offer in 5G, right? So, so the British uh, government's attitude, I think, is a more reasonable one, which is that if there's a problem, then deal with that particular problem rather than dealing with Huawei altogether. But now we don't know now. After the coronavirus, they may actually change their mind. Hmm. Okay. Let me come back to you, Chris, on the other questions which we've, we've had coming in. Um, and this relates to one of the things we were touching on earlier and related to the trade relationship. Do you see post-COVID a major restructuring of U.S. imports? Is it going to be taken from other countries, other markets, or can that be shifted, decoupled so easily? You're talking to me? Yes. Sorry, Lucy, I was talking to you. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, you know, one thing that we is a big unknown is how much um, COVID, for instance, will affect the U.S. economy. And... If, you know, we, we, to a great extent, we, the American consumer, uh, has gotten a free ride on the back of Chinese low-cost wood labor uh, for the last 20, 25 years. Um, so the shirt I just bought, um, now that industry is moving out of China to a certain degree, but the underlying, the, the, the yarn um, is still in China. Um, the glass, the drinking glass I have, like so many items in our life and in our household, um, even things that appear to be made in America are to a certain extent dependent on low cost Chinese labor. We could easily see a situation where if you had decoupling combined with a severe recession here, that the cost of those consumer goods could go up significantly. Um, and, and that that uh, could hit American households to a degree that we're not um, expecting at the moment. Uh, on the other side, uh, U.S. exports, um, the Americans were exporting a lot uh, in terms of agricultural goods to China, and one of the precipitating factors of the trade war was this idea that China had stopped buying. Well, what really happened was China had a very um, mistaken uh, reserves policy where they had stuffed up their national, their state grains reserves with um, grains bought at very high cost and imported at high cost from the U.S. and from other countries. And they finally realized this, stopped a lot of imports and started eating down those grains reserves. Um, but the failure on the American side to understand what was driving those purchases uh, led to a debilitating crash um, for many American farmers in that export market. Um, and so again, you can see that the way these things play out isn't always the way we expect. Um, but overall, I think the decoupling is going to uh, raise the cost of living in the United States um, and lay bare a lot of the structural inequities that have developed here. Um, one thing about China is it certainly has a tendency to kind of reveal your vulnerabilities. Um, and I think that we could be um, very surprised to see how that plays out in our economy. Yeah. Yeah, as you know, I mean, 
production chains and supply chains are very complex entities. And I know, you know, some businesses were trying to move to Vietnam, including Chinese businesses, so they didn't show up on the export rolls. But one of the things they were telling me, their problems are that, one, you know, the workforce isn't sufficiently trained. I mean, China's had 20, 30 years of experience of that. And two, a lot of the pieces to put together, they were still having to bring in from China. And so this idea that companies can simply step out and produce somewhere else is much more complex than you might think. Yes, uh, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, but it is also true when these companies started producing in China, they had similar complaints about Chinese workers, Chinese factories, Chinese supply base. These things, um, in many ways, these things happen not because you go to a school of supply chain and study and pass the exam. You just have to do it. So, so, so the more companies do it, then the more capabilities are going to be accumulated. I actually believe that this time around, it's going to be faster than the Chinese learning curve 20 years ago, 15 years ago. The reason is, as you pointed out, Tony, it's because Chinese companies are also part of this global supply chain re uh, rearrangement. Uh, they're going to, just like Taiwanese companies, Taiwanese companies taught the Chinese companies how to do manufacturing. Chinese companies can do that, except there are m many, many more Chinese companies who can do that as compared with the Taiwanese companies in the 1990s. So uh, Vietnam, because uh, I teach uh, students in my program who are actively thinking about moving their supply chain to Vietnam. And they have told me that they have done it faster than they anticipated. It can be done. But Lucy is also right. During this period of time, the U.S. consumers are going to pay a price. One of the underappreciated aspects of Chinese and U.S. supply chain relationship is that the U.S. consumers have been able to pay very low prices for the products that they consume. And they, they don't typically think of, thank Chinese workers, thank Chinese companies when they do that, but they should actually. So during this adjustment phase, there is going to be a price uh, adjustment. Let me also say something else, which is that people believe that deglobalization is not going to happen because of this, because of that. Actually, deglobalization happened between the First World War and the Second World War. If you look at investment as a share of GDP, during the First World War, it was a very high level. It didn't recover to that level until the 1960s. So economics is not like physics. You can actually violate economic rules, except that you just have to pay a higher price. So I believe globalization Deglobalization is going to happen. It doesn't mean that all the factories are going to come back to the United States, but more and more production is going to move to Southeast Asia uh, away from China. I think even if manufacturing comes back to the US, jobs won't because of automation and other factors. And most surveys have already shown that a lot of the job loss in the US is really because of automated processes. Okay. Um, we have a couple of other questions and, and not a lot of time, uh, but let's come to some of the politics uh, to wrap up with this. And uh, one question we have uh, is about what the US role in Hong Kong should be given this national security legislation, uh, which has been instigated by the Chinese National People's Congress on the mainland, and also about any potential plans for Taiwan. Uh, Lucy, would you like to start us off on that question? It's the billion dollar question. Um, so uh, I think that the uh, what's happening in Hong Kong is that China is basically saying, you know, enough of this pretense that it's a separate entity. It's ours now. Um, and the Hong Kong people uh, have already felt marginalized under the previous 20 years. Um, 
in which they were ruled remotely by China, I think what you're going to see is a lot of resistance to being subsumed into southern China. Um, but it's very hard to see how any international state can do anything about it because every international state recognizes China's sovereignty over Hong Kong. Um, one of the questions, though, is to what degree uh, China's Hong Kong experience will lead it to be more assertive regarding Taiwan. Um, and I think that that is the really scary question for a lot of people who see Taiwan as a flashpoint, um, either because they're sympathetic uh, to millions, tens of millions of Taiwanese uh, people, um, or because they don't want to see a real war break out over that island. Um, so I think that's definitely one of the, the major flashpoints to look forward to. I don't think that there's any easy answer to it. And um, just as a side note, for those of you who don't necessarily follow Chinese official propaganda, um, the events of this past weekend have led the Chinese propaganda machine to draw a lot of um, um, unflattering comparisons between the demonstrations in the U.S. and the demonstrations that tore apart Hong Kong uh, last fall. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very difficult for the U.S. Um, unilaterally uh, to remove the uh, special status for Hong Kong, because as I think as a number of people are pointing out, that could be extremely detrimental to citizens living in Hong Kong and presumably to also international business operating out of Hong Kong. And so perhaps a more sophisticated approach, which may target uh, particular Chinese individuals or particular Chinese companies uh, might be a more nuanced uh, route uh, to take. Um, one of the other questions which sort of again pitches us into the future, and I'm looking to you now, Yoshan, is that uh, should uh, Vice President Biden uh, become uh, president, will that affect the relationship with China? I think the opinion survey shows that Democrats and Republicans share the view that China is a strate strategically competitive and even hostile power to the United States. But they differ in their degree of that view. Republicans tend to be more hawkish as compared with Democrats. And Democrats also are more nuanced, I think, in their view about China. Uh, the Democrats care about human rights dimensions as well, not just strategic competition. I think Democrats probably put more value on science, so they see the value of scientific collaborations. So if you look at some big areas where the two countries really need to collaborate, they need to collaborate on public health, they need to collaborate on global warming, they need to collaborate on energy future, they need to collaborate on pollution, all these areas are the areas that Democrats emphasize. Republicans don't really emphasize those areas, and therefore they don't really see the value of collaboration with China. So I would say if um, uh, Biden became uh, the president of the United States, uh, the Democratic administration would be more um, nuanced and more uh, measured in terms of its view toward China, and hopefully it would have a more rational approach towards China. Because the whole issue, as all three of us would probably agree, the whole issue is complicated. And that's one other difference between the Cold War before and the Cold War today. It's complicated and more nuanced. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I've often tried to argue is that there's not a lot you can do with the existing structures because they're baked in as a part of the, you know, the post Second World War apparatus. And in some ways, China feels frustrated that those rules of the game were defined without their participation. But I think if we, as some of the areas you're suggesting, I would put under categories of global commons. Okay. And I think if you think about some of the new global public goods, it seems to me there there's an opportunity for the U.S., for China, and other emerging important powers and existing powers like the European Union to come to protocols and structures which might give voice to different countries. And that might be a small step towards building some kind of incremental trust. Uh, 
And then I think the second is the question of just being honest. I think we have to accept there are certain areas where the US and China can never agree. And we have to accept that. But that shouldn't throw everything out. And then to try and strive towards uh, looking at those areas. And I think the ones you've indicated are, are the most interesting around things like the climate change, law of the seas, a range of other uh, areas as well, where you might be able to form some kinds of uh, partnership. Uh, I'm really sorry, but I'm looking at the clock and I see that the bewitching hour has come. Um, I really want to thank both of you uh, for your very thoughtful responses and comments. I learned a lot listening to the two of you. And I just want to thank again uh, all the staff at the Kennedy a library uh, for putting together uh, this forum this evening. So again, thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody for listening in. And I want to thank uh, for the questions that came in. And I'm very sorry that I couldn't get to all uh, the questions uh, that we received. So have a good evening uh, for the rest of you. And uh, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.